Hello and welcome. My name is Andrew Hamilton and I'm the president of New York University. And it's my great pleasure to introduce this very special and historic video. 50 years ago this year, a mere several hundred yards away from campus, the Stonewall Uprising marked one of the most significant social turning points of our time. Since then, the village has continued to be ground zero for the LGBTQ rights movement. And I'm proud to say that the NYU community has contributed to this distinguished crusade. There are so many stories that illustrate the evolution of this transformative movement. The people you're about to meet in this video, all part of the NYU community, have shared their stories with us through oral history interviews that will become part of the university archives. By taking a look back, we can indeed move forward with greater understanding of how Stonewall has influenced our community at NYU, as well as with a renewed vigor in taking on the challenges that still lie ahead. The rebellion began at 1.20 a.m. A high school classmate called me and he said, Bobby, there's something going on in Greenwich Village in which I think you might be interested. The night of the Stonewall Rebellion, the police were there because they hadn't been paid off that week. Given all of the harassment they'd experienced over the years, it just boiled over. There was a response from the people inside the bar, as well as people in the community milling around. So the police were outnumbered. I went down to the village um, the following night. There was a lot of rubble in the street. Things were overturned. There were police you know, barricades blocking off Sheridan Square completely. The riots did go on for four or five days. I mean, there weren't really riots. People were milling in the streets every night. They were shouting. Ultimately, there were like several thousand people milling about. And so my friend said, what do you want to do? I said, organize. What Stonewall really is was a turning point in the same way that the Montgomery bus boycott was a turning point. There was a civil rights movement for 50 years before Rosa Parks refused to give her seat up on the bus. It's very much mythologized, but it has played a symbolic role in the gay rights movement. I grew up in a tiny little town in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Gay rights was suddenly being talked about as something that was um, a burgeoning movement. And where that came from, even in my tiny little town, was a place called Stonewall. It was extremely explosive time. There was Vietnam, and this was the time of the Democratic 1968 convention where the police came in and bashed in the head, so it was sort of analogous to Stonewall. Somehow some of these people reminded me of maybe what I was afraid I might be. And, you know, these kids, they were kids, and they were drag queens, and some of them were trans, and some, they were people of color the people that came out of that time, you know, they kind of seemed smart and they kind of seemed interesting and they kind of seemed like people that I would want to hang around with. In my view, what the rebellion did was really put lesbian and gay, because that's what it was then, activism on a scale that had never been seen before. To at least even notice what some of these inequalities were and to think, oh, it could be different. It's hard for people today to imagine uh, how awful our lives were. Whoever was the current mayor would say that he was cleaning up prostitution, he was gonna get rid of the perverts, and the bars would be raided more frequently. It was illegal for two people of the same sex to dance together, to not wear clothes of your own gender. If you had a student ID, they would call the school and tell them you had been in the bar. They would call your employer. They would call your parents. Anybody they could call, they would call your landlord. 
And so without having ever been arrested, you could lose everything. You'd lose your apartment, you'd lose your education, you'd lose your job, you'd lose everything because you'd been in that bar. So the thought of being arrested in the bar was terrifying to people. And why did we go there? There was no other place. Stonewall was really the spark. But the torch that was lit there was the Gay Liberation Front. And less than a month later, the Gay Liberation Front organized, and I joined. I organized a series of rallies, protests, and demonstrations leading up to the first Christopher Street Liberation Day march, in which I was also an organizer. The march took place a year after Stonewall. It did go to that, but I, I had gone already to Washington, so I was at the big anti-war Vietnam marches. I'd been tear gassed at school. I'd been tear gassed in Washington. Uh, my friends had been arrested. I didn't really want to get arrested or anything. I was there by myself. So at first, I actually stood on the sidewalk. And at 14th Street, after hearing everyone screaming, out of the sidewalks and onto the streets, off of the sidewalks, whatever, I finally had the guts to go onto the street. The Gay Liberation Front later organized what happened uh, primarily at Weinstein Hall. Ellen Broidy was the president of the Student Homophile League at NYU, and she asked the GLF for their support in having a dance. We wanted social venues that were safe. The administration at NYU said we could have the dance if we could get a psychiatrist to say that we were not mentally ill and that the dance would not be a threat to people at NYU. Now in 1970, homosexuality was classified by the American Psychiatric Association as a mental illness. So we knew where this was going. So we decided that the best thing to do was to seize NYU. We would seize Weinstein Hall, the dormitory on University Place, and seize the sub-basement where this dance was going to take place. There were several groups that came out of this city. Sylvia Rivera was there among the protesters, and Sylvia and Marsha P. Johnson formed a group called Street Transvestites Action Revolutionaries, which they called STAR. And it was the first trans group in the world. And that came out of that basement in Weinstein Hall. March 14th of 1971, we had the first statewide march on uh, Albany for gay rights. And then all of these other groups and community centers and synagogues and churches and everything all started after, started escalating and becoming much more known. More people came out. I think that was the big thing also. After Stonewall, that was the rallying cry. If you can't start an organization, come out to your parents, come out. It still took me a while to really come to terms with fully coming out as a lesbian. And there's several reasons for that. One is that in those days, I mean, it wasn't until 1973 that being gay or lesbian was officially taken off the books as a psychiatric diagnosis. At the time, if child welfare found out that the children were living with a gay or lesbian parent, that was it. They took the children uh, just for that reason alone. I have three kids, and so it was a pretty scary thing. I came out of the closet because I went to NYU at a particular time. They are intertwined in my experience as a gay man and my feeling comfortable in my own skin. So 1978 was post-Stonewall and pre-AIDS. It was a very heady time. And uh, it was a pretty fabulous time to be gay. The world was gay. We were in the heart of the village. I moved into the Weinstein dormitory in, the, in September of 1981. And I had read a lot about Stonewall. I, I mean, I really knew who and what I was. And I'm, uh, I just have always believed in the promise of the Constitution of the United States and in what it means to be free and live a dignified life. And so I 
was hungry for some sense of freedom because I felt so shackled by my, the secret of my sexuality. So on my second day living in New York, I walked by the Stonewall Inn and it was a bagel shop. There was, not, there was no sign that said Stonewall, there wasn't a plaque on the building, there was not a hint that this place was the birthplace of our revolution. And so I went inside and I had a cup of coffee and a bagel and I just said a silent prayer that somehow I could find the strength to be out, to be myself, to find love, to find freedom and to sort of claim my place in the world. In uh, July of 1981, the New York Times published the first article about uh, a disease that would later come to be called acquired immune deficiency syndrome. I had to work while I was in school and I had an uncle who worked at NYU Medical Center and I got a job at the medical center. So my early experience with the gay community was admitting these beautiful, vibrant young men into the hospital and, and seeing them waste. And that both terrorized me and galvanized me. After I graduated from, from Tisch, uh, I was actually an actor for a good portion of the 1980s. Um, and in 1985, I had the privilege and the honor to co-star in the very first dramatic film about AIDS, a film called Buddies. It was directed by Arthur J. Bresson, Jr. And uh, I play a buddy, which is a, a, a volunteer who commits to spending time with a person with AIDS to do for them whatever it is that they need. Ronald Reagan was in his second term of the White House uh, in 1985, and when we shot Buddies, he had still not yet made a single policy statement around AIDS. It was infuriating uh, as to how an entire swath of people could be neglected, ignored, vilified. The, the panic was palpable. In those days it was called GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. There was no HIV test, there were no drugs. It was not unusual for people with AIDS to be abandoned by their friends and lovers and families. There was so much fear and misinformation and disinformation that, uh, and lack of resources. It was devastating. In my 20s and 30s, I was going to a funeral every week. Suddenly you were seeing the manifestations of it in your classroom, on your street, in your apartment building, you know, in the corridors of your workplace. And so in 1987, when ACT UP was formed, when the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power was formed, basically conversations start happening that more drugs get in the pipeline, more research and development. In 1992, Stanford University, um, the University of Chicago, the University of Iowa, Pitzer College, had all passed same-sex domestic partner benefits. And it was like, now it's time for NYU to pass them as well. It wasn't fair that straight married couples were able to cover their spouses and not take, have to take that money out of their pocket. It came out of a group of lesbians um, called the Violets, who were quite vocal about just lesbian and gay issues at the university in general. And the Violets transformed into the association of lesbian and gay faculty, administrators, and staff. And we met monthly. Uh, starting in about in the end of 1991, 1992, AIDS was still rampant at that time. So there were a lot of deaths from AIDS, and the university was very concerned that a lot of cases would come before them, uh, health benefit cases that would be two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 each, and how could they handle that? Our job was to strategize and say, you know, this is what the uni Stanford University did, this is what University of Chicago did, and this is, and we, we can tell you, no. There's not an onslaught of people. Also, think about recruitment. You know, if you want to become one of the number one universities around the world, you're going to need to recruit really good people. And some of those really good people are gay. 
In those days, those of us who were academics were acutely aware of which colleges and universities offered partner benefits and which did not. And so if you were taking care of the economic life of your family, there had to be partner benefits. I was gay bashed in New York City. I was beaten within an inch of my life. Uh, three guys jumped me from behind on Montague Street in Brooklyn Heights and said, you're nothing but a fag, we're gonna kill you. And I woke up in the hospital with broken mandible in two places, a hematoma on my brain. I say this in reference to how NYU made it possible for me to live this life because my colleagues at NYU and the students that I worked with at NYU and you know, just that community rallied around me. They let me know that I was supported, not in spite of who I was, but because of who I was. And you know, I really gained strength from that. We did a show, the title of the show was Faggots, and there was a photographer by the name of Arnie Svensson, and you'd come to his studio, and there was a mark on the floor, and you stood there just in a blank way, and there were 78 of us who had our pictures taken. And the first sentence or two of his uh, blurb for the exhibition was, I want to see what you see when you see me walking down the street with my partner and you yell out, faggot. What is it that you see? I learned about the Stonewall Uprising when I was living and working in Chicago. Chicago has a thriving gay and lesbian scene. I actually ran a coming out group for young adults who were scared about coming out, who weren't ready to do it, who needed to be talked off the ledge. If it weren't for the Stonewall Riots, I don't think Queer Eye could have happened. Queer Eye for the Straight Guy was the first show in television history to have an all gay out cast. Queer Eye also made it necessary for me to come out to my parents. <laughs> We were setting out to advance a civil rights aim in a sense because we were all being openly gay and unapologetic. Just being willing to declare yourself is a political act. Edith Windsor. When I worked at the Office of University Events, they were responsible for um, holding the commencement. So I remember when um, they announced that it would be Edith Windsor that was getting the award. Um, it was, you know, it was internally, it was like, oh my God, like, this is fabulous. The police raid at Stonewall in 1969 that galvanized the gay community ultimately sparked your own service as a lifelong activist struggling for the rights of LGBT citizens, among them the right to marry, which you were so long denied. Engaged for four decades, you took the fight all the way to the United States Supreme Court. The six years that I've done stage management uh, for commencement at NYU, uh, it probably had to be one of the loudest roars I've ever heard from the students. She received the award. And just how it felt to me in that moment, um, just, you know, just getting really emotional. Uh, I'm getting emotional now talking about it. Um, it was such a, such an experience. My college roommate was the mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio. My husband and I, renewed our vows on the steps of City Hall. And to say those words, uh, in sickness and in health till death do us part, and know that they're not just words between two people, but that the federal government has to recognize them. It was everything that my neighbors have, that my brothers and sisters have, everything I ever dreamed of. I remember sitting in a meeting and there was 10 people around the table. And I don't know why I did this, but I counted the, who I knew was gay. And there was five out of the 10, including myself. And I thought, 50% of us are gay. And I never thought being that, you know, young Indian girl from Wolverhampton, England, that I'd be sitting amongst people that weren't shy to say that they were gay. 
You know, I put together our admissions events for CAS. Sometimes a, a kid will bring his girlfriend, sometimes a kid will bring her boyfriend or whatever. Two Aprils ago, I realized that here's two proud parents and their son and their son's boyfriend. And that was the equality that I could have only dreamed about. We, the people, declare today that the most evident of truths, that all of us are created equal, is the star that guides us still, just as it guided our forebears through Seneca Falls and Selma and Stonewall. It is now our generation's task to carry on what those pioneers began. Our journey is not complete until our gay brothers and sisters are treated like anyone else under the law. It's always a challenge, I think, to convey to younger students who have grown up, um, maybe the first American president that they were aware of was Obama. Um, maybe, you know, they, they didn't know a world in which one of the 50 states legalized gay marriage. Um, it, it's hard to convey how risky um, expressions of LBGT um, desire have been in the past when it doesn't feel risky at all. Lots of states and localities, as we know, have in fact passed laws, anti-discrimination laws. You can't lose your job, you can't be kicked out of your housing just for that reason alone and so forth. We still don't have that on the national level. It's not there. It's stunning to me that despite all the gains that have been made, there's no federal civil rights protection. In the wee hours of uh, Sunday, June 12, 2016, uh, a gunman went into one of our sanctuaries, the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, and opened fire and killed 49 of our own. By 6 o'clock p.m. that Sunday afternoon, my friends and I had organized uh, what we thought was going to be a vigil, and there were people as far as the eye could see. We are a community that will never be silent again. It was, it was the convergence of our community, the likes of which I had never seen, and frankly, because it was a tragedy, hope never to see again. So in mid-June of 2016, President Barack Obama named the Stonewall, the little park in front of Stonewall, a national monument. It was the very, very, very first LGBT uh, national mo monument of its kind. It gave us a place at the table. It recognized the fact that the Stonewall Bar was basically the resistance heard around the world. It was a, it was a pivotal moment. It's a place that we go to in times of triumph, in times of joy, but also in times of sorrow. The Stonewall today has nothing to do with the Stonewall in, you know, 50 years ago. No, the bar never recovered. The bar was destroyed. And it was years later that it was revived. But the bar isn't a national monument. The monument is the uprising. And that area between 7th Avenue South and Sheridan Square, that is the monument where we have to celebrate the valor of the people who fought. For me, Stonewall is constantly changing. I think that we can re-experience things and understand new aspects of the past. So one of the things that um, the Stonewall Uprising has meant to many people is, you know, gay pride and, and you know, gay liberation. I, it also has this really important trans dimension. And so already we can see that there's a shift in understanding of what that event was. It's bittersweet thinking about those who came before me and even though they didn't get to live to see what their legacy has built, I think it's important that we keep doing that work as if they would be able to see it. I would say that the students currently, what they're yearning for is LGBTQ services that speak to 
their multiple identities, their intersections. One thing I see is like the importance to um, protect like QTPOC, so queer and trans people of colour. The fact that black trans women have like a life expectancy of 35 in this country, like, it's ridiculous. There's been a transformation in language about how we talk about gender um, in particular. And for our trans students, I think that transformation has continu continued to move forward, um, but our institutions are still needing to catch up. Even just having like a one minute talk about like what pronouns is, how, what does it mean to like respect someone's pronouns? Why don't we just assume that everybody uses the set that we think that they do? Like that just can make all the difference in the world. The legacies of Stonewall are just as important as the event. I mean, even like the biggest LGBTQ um, organization in England is called Stonewall. What's so important about Stonewall is that we've been told that it's okay to have this voice. Like we don't have to sit and take discrimination or oppression. We can fight for these rights. We don't have to sit back and take injustice. The world is such a better place than it was in 1969. But we still have to fight for the people who are most disadvantaged in our society, uh, for trans people who are getting killed in the street, particularly trans women who are being beaten up and murdered at an astonishing rate in this country, uh, for lesbians who live overwhelmingly below the poverty line because of their lifestyle choices. There's quite a way to go in this country and around the world. People need to come out about what's important to them. They need to realize that they have agency. And there's not one person who had a hand in Stonewall that thought that they were gonna do that when they got up that morning. We all have a voice, a unique voice, that really does create change, that really does make things happen.